God calls us to worship this morning with these simple words from Acts chapter 3, verse 36, where Peter says to his audience on that first Pentecost, and this is based upon the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let us bow in a moment of, sil of silent prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. our opening hymn of praise to our God, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Number 357, let's rise to sing the three stanzas. Congregation, as the beloved people of God assembled in his presence, it is our heart's confession that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You, must, you may be seated. Let us listen once again to the law of our God. And one of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ conquered through his resurrection from the dead was the penalty and the curse of the law from standing over us and continually judging us unto condemnation. And uh, yet, in, uh, in light of the fact that uh, the Lord has kept all of these commandments perfectly for us 
and that he has uh, borne the consequences of our breaking them, we as God's people are now called to walk in uh, obedience. And uh, how do we know uh, what obedience looks like? We look to the ten words of the covenant, the ten commandments. We hear these words coming to us from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now, Lord Jesus Christ summarized these Ten Commandments for us into two great commandments in Matthew 22, when he said that the first and great commandment is this, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As our assurance of pardon this morning, I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. Now, let's read this together. And this is the, uh, John's record of the resurrection story, the resurrection of our, G of our Lord Jesus Christ. Testimony that the Lord indeed has fulfilled his promise. John chapter 20, we'll be reading from verse 1 to 18 together. Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting at verse 1. John records this, of course, under the inspiration of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit, and so this is God's inspired word, God's infallible, uh, authoritative word. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. In response, let's uh, turn in our hymnal to number 329, O love of God, how strong and true. Number 329, let's remain seated to sing all the stanzas. As we go to our God in our morning congregational prayer today, um, we have uh, one thing that we can give a special thanks for um, and be joyful for, uh, Trent and Madeline uh, Scoling were blessed last Friday night with a beautiful baby girl, Amaya, uh, Amaya Margaret, and uh, as far as we know, mother and child is doing well, and grandma and grandpa are even doing better. So uh, we can give thanks to our Lord that, uh, that uh, he has blessed them uh, finally after a long wait with uh, a new baby girl. Let us go to our God and Father. Our Heavenly Father, on this Easter morning, as our hearts turn not only to the suffering of our Savior on the cross, 
but his rising from the dead and uh, arising from the tomb, conquering sin and death for us. And with this in mind, we ascribe to you, we render to you, O Lord and God, all glory and strength, because we are reminded once again this morning on this Easter Sunday that it is to you and you alone that all glory and strength belong. We ascribe to you the praise due to your name as we come together as your people to worship you on this Lord's Day, but also to commemorate and to remember the, uh, the arising of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have not left us in our sin and misery, but you have done all that is needful for us to reconcile us to you, to ensure that we would be washed from our sins and renewed so that we have gone from slaves and servants, outcasts and aliens, to children of the living God through Christ and through his perfect work. And so indeed, Father, we declare you worthy, our Lord and God, to receive all praise and glory and power for you created all things, and by your will, all things have their being. And indeed, Father, even more than this, you have brought about a new creation in Christ. We greet you on this Easter morning with adoration. We meet you with thanksgiving for your glorious victory over sin and death, for raising your Son, our Savior, after three days being buried in the tomb, for fulfilling the promise made so many years before to our parents Adam and Eve when they fell from, uh, from, from grace in the Garden of Eden. And yet even at that time you promised to send one who would crush the head of the serpent and who would reconcile us to you. And in Christ Jesus you have done this. We thank you and we give you praise, Father, because at the end of the day, you are the conquering king. And it is to you all praise and adoration belong. And so we give you praise for your conquest of sin and its consequences over us. We thank you for our beautiful Savior, voluntary victim of death, yet triumphant over our greatest enemy. And so, Father, fill our hearts indeed with joy this morning by your Holy Spirit, that we may truly sing your praises, that we may yearn to hear your word, and that our hearts may be filled with thanksgiving and adoration and praise for you who have not left us in our sin, but you have saved us by your power. And indeed, Father, may this not be restricted to today, but every day. May the wonder of the resurrection be a part of our thinking, that we may always be reminded be conscious of the fact that we are right with you, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Father, we give you thanks for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us as a congregation, as families, and as a church family. We give you thanks for Trent and Maddie Scoling as they were blessed this Friday night with a beautiful baby girl. We thank you for Amea, Margaret. We thank you that uh, you brought her into this world safely and that you provided in the way of medical care uh, for her birth, for her safe birth and arrival into this world. We thank you that Maddie and Amea are doing well from all reports, and uh, we pray that you would continue to bless them in the coming days and weeks ahead. And especially, Father, we pray for Trent and Maddie as they now take up the responsibility for the first time that you have laid upon them to be parents uh, of this child that you have entrusted into their care. We pray that you would... Um, Continue, Father, to bless all our young parents, and especially our new parents, as they fulfill their calling. Uh, we pray that you would uh, cause them in every day to look to you in trust and find their strength, uh, physically, emotionally, and especially spiritually, uh, to, um, to fulfill their calling every day and every moment. We also give you thanks, Father, for the blessing that uh, was bestowed upon the council members, the elders and deacons, as we... Uh, were uh, witnesses of the professions of faith uh, interviews this past week. We thank you for the testimony that we were able to hear and to be reminded again of the desire of our young people uh, having 
uh, either been raised in covenant homes or having come into the faith uh, later in life and, uh, and at this point uh, taking hold of what has been announced to them and what they have come to learn uh, and Father now uh, desiring to live for you and uh, not only beginning but to continue to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, that you are indeed building your church and so that when we pray, thy kingdom come, you are indeed uh, causing your church to grow through uh, internally, through the birth that we, um, that we are blessed with in, as a congregation and bringing in um, uh, others into our fold. And we thank you for these things and we pray that uh, the gospel indeed, that glorious gospel may continue to go forth and reach out to the nations all across the world in this world of great turmoil and troubles and sadness and sorrow um, we, and, and uh, unjust uh, treatments of, uh, of people. We pray that the glorious gospel may go out and bless the hearts of many. Father, we also give you much thanks. And we recognize your greatness, your power, your love and your faithfulness. In light of the progress of our brother Henry Phelan, we are delighted, we are thrilled. Uh, we stand in awe and wonder of you, Father, when we hear that he is up, that he is walking around, that he is making continued progress, that he is expected to make a full recovery. And for this, Father, we have no other thanks to give but to you and no other praise to give but to you. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we pray that you would bless him in the coming days and weeks ahead, uh, that he may continue to uh, make progress and that things may continue to go well, that there may be no uh, further complications and that uh, he may soon be restored to his family at home and be with us again in church. We thank you once again, Father, also for, for how you have blessed his wife, Andrea, how you have blessed all his loved ones during this time, how you have walked with them, and indeed, Father, how you have carried them and embraced them and consoled their hearts and given, given them hope during this very difficult time. Uh, we pray that you would uh, uh, bless them in the, uh, as they continue to walk this journey uh, with Henry and uh, we thank you that you have given them some relief and some joy in their hearts at this time and uh, that the future looks bright as, uh, as you continue to shine your light and your grace upon this family. Father, we thank you um, for the general good health and well-being of our members here. We thank you that, um, that uh, overall speaking, you, you do bless us. You do bless us with, um, with, your, uh, with uh, measures of your kindness and of your grace. Uh, you give us uh, healthy children, uh, healthy members. You bless us uh, with, um, with uh, conceptions and births and, uh, and growth in our faith. And in many ways, Father, we can count ourselves uh, so blessed as a congregation. And yet we know that there are those in our midst who suffer and struggle from a, on a day-to-day -day basis with ongoing uh, chronic health concerns. Uh, we think especially of our sister May with MS and Doris with Crohn's and migraines and other things. Our uh, little sister and daughter, Annalie Pauls, we pray that you will uh, continue, Father, to open doors that she may get the treatment that she needs and they w that they would discover, um, uh, make discoveries as they do research on, uh, on her illness and that, the, that she too may uh, maybe someday have the hope of relief. And um, we pray for Haas and Ina. We pray for Mrs. Brink in Ramoka as well. Uh, continue to comfort the hearts of those who suffer and struggle in various ways. And we pray that you would um, uh, continue to, to uh, point us to the way of, of, uh, of help and hope and to know where to put our trust, which is in you. We pray for those parents of young children um, who suffer with respiratory uh, problems, lung and breathing struggles, uh, those families where there are children with special needs and special care needs to be taken, perhaps those families where there are special struggles. We pray that you would grant to them your blessing and your grace as well. Continue to watch over uh, those with child, our pregnant mothers. Uh, keep them safe and in your care. And we pray for these covenant children that they carry in their womb who are members of this congregation already, unborn members. We pray that you would bless them and be near to them as well. And, uh, watch over them during this, uh, uh, during this time of, uh, of gestation. We also give you thanks, Father, on behalf of our sister, uh, Hilly Feitzma, as she was able to receive her gallbladder surgery this past week. We thank you that all things went well overall and that she could be well on the way to healing. And we pray that uh, whatever pain may be associated with the healing process, that it may not be uh, too difficult and that you would bring her uh, safely through this without complications and restore her in time to full and good health. Bless 
Father, as we remember this, we remember the caregivers of our congregation as well, the husbands, the, the wives, children and loved ones of those uh, who suffer along with uh, those who are either uh, recovering from health concerns or, or from uh, surgeries or, or with ongoing health concerns. We pray for your strength uh, for them as well. Uh, we pray that you would uh, uh, be with others in the congregation where there are tests and uh, diagnoses being done, um, those who are undergoing treatments in various ways. We pray that you would carry them through this. And again, Father, uh, may the love of the congregation surround them and uh, uh, encourage each other with our prayers. And may we know, all of us know, where our help comes from. We pray for loved ones, uh, near and far, uh, with health concerns as well. Uh, we pray for loved ones near and far who are of spiritual concern to us. We pray that you will hear our prayers on their behalf and, and do all that is good and best for them. Father, we pray for our brother John Doubledam, uh, who is under the second step of discipline at this time. Uh, we pray that you would so work in his heart that uh, he would seek to make reconciliation between himself and the church here and uh, that he would... Um, uh, find either uh, or either be restored to this congregation or find a congregation where he would uh, uh, submit himself to the leadership there. And uh, we pray that you would work in his heart and incline his will to do your will. Father, we also pray for those of spiritual concern to the elders. We pray for the lost and the wandering sheep. We pray that you would watch over them and, do, and, and so work in their hearts that they would uh, uh, submit to your will. And uh, Father, uh, we pray that you would um, so... Uh, work in our hearts by the reading of scripture, the hearing of, of sermons, by the, um, the, the study of, of the Christian religion as we do it, that uh, more and more we may be convicted and brought under the conviction that uh, we are to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are to, to um, put ourselves over the, under the oversight of, of your overseers that you have entrusted into the congregation. Uh, bless us and guide us on our way in all things, Father and lead us by your Holy Spirit in all things. Uh, bless us as we now read a portion of your word, and as we hear that word proclaimed to us, may we uh, be, be edified in our hearts, and above all, Father, may you be glorified, may the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted as the, the only Savior of, of the world. We pray this in his name alone. Amen. Congregation, please turn, me, uh, turn with me to the Gospel of John once again, chapter 20. And we'll pick up our reading from verse 19. Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19, we'll read to the end of that chapter. And our text specifically will be Thomas's words uh, when he says, uh, My Lord and my God in... Uh, John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. Then the same, evening, same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight, days of his, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hand, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing." And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Our song of preparation is number 362, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain. Let's rise to sing the three stanzas of number 362. Your able congregation, please keep your Bibles open to John chapter 20 as we look at this passage this morning, especially verse 28, where uh, Thomas confesses, My Lord and my God, which will be our text for this morning. Congregation of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the world today goes on their Easter egg hunts and, do, and, and engages in all the silly things that they will find to do with this day, uh, we have gathered as God's people, not only on this Lord's Day as we are called to, to uh, commemorate uh, the, um, the, the Savior of the world, but to commemorate, especially on this Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our risen Savior, the resurrection of Christ uh, as believers. We have believed even though we have not seen. And that, that's the difference between, say, an, a believer and an unbeliever. To an unbeliever, they would say, seeing is believing. And if you've ever had discussions with, with people who we uh, term unbelievers, people who are, who are unchurched, you, you quickly find out that they have maybe thought about this whole issue of Christ rising from the dead for maybe about two minutes, and they quickly reject it based upon uh, uh, their, their uh, reflecting upon it. Uh, and they always come to the same conclusion, Christianity, if you are asking me to believe in uh, a, a man Jesus who rose from the dead, that, that's too much of a leap of faith. That's too much for me to believe without any kind of evidence. And of course we know that the Holy Spirit has to regenerate somebody's heart, of course. Um, we speak humanly speaking here. Um, we know that the Holy Spirit has to work in someone's heart, uh, heart for them, to, to, uh, for them to, to, to really believe. But unregenerate man, apart from the working of the Holy Spirit, they reason something like this. You want me to believe that this man, Jesus, rose from the dead based on what? Where is the physical evidence? What, what do you have based on uh, your word 
your testimony based on some ancient manuscript? Uh, where is the physical evidence, they would say? How do I know that somebody hasn't pulled the biggest practical joke ever and convinced gullible Christians like you through all of history that the Bible is God's word and, and that Jesus, this Jesus whom you speak of, actually rose from the dead? How do I know that this man Jesus is really who he says he is or what the Bible records he is? Because they would say, seeing is believing. Give me physical evidence. And yet, the heart of Christianity is faith. Faith is in an unseen God. Faith in unseen promises. Faith in an unseen risen Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe even though we have not seen. And praise God for this. Praise God for the grace that He has given to each and every one of us that we may believe having not seen the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to remember that that's what is called skepticism, any kind of doubting or questioning is, is nothing new. And we see this even in our account this morning, that even one of the very disciples of Jesus wanted a little more proof than just word of mouth. Thomas wanted physical evidence that Jesus was alive. The sense of the Greek is that he says to them, uh, just a paraphrase, I will never believe unless I see and touch for myself. In verse 19, John records that the risen Lord had appeared a first time to the disciples a week prior, about eight days prior, according to verse uh, 26. And John tells us that at that time, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. This, of course, was a very tense time, a very frightening time for them, because three days before, what had happened? The religious leaders had handed Jesus over to the Romans, and he was crucified. And the tentacles of the Sanhedrin could very easily stretch out if they decided to the hand or to the followers of Jesus. And the Jews at that time wielded some influence among the Romans and they were not afraid to use it. And it would have meant no sleepless nights for them to round up and slaughter the followers of Jesus with great zeal and haste. And so the disciples stayed together, huddled together behind locked doors. And John records for us in verse 19 that Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. And he said to them, Peace be with you. Now we understand from this that with his, resurre with his resurrection body, Jesus could now pass through solid objects. A locked door posed no problem for him. Well, after the disciples had probably picked themselves up off the floor from their fright, Jesus showed them his hands and his side in verse 20, we see that in verse 20, and we read that the disciples were glad, they were overjoyed. Now we're not told where Thomas was or why he was absent that day, but we can be sure that this too was within God's will. Now Thomas, uh, just an, as an aside, Thomas by the way has been misnamed Doubting Thomas by many people. Sometimes you'll come across Bible, Tom, uh, Bible studies and they'll talk about uh, Doubting Thomas. Um, but he really isn't portrayed as having a doubting personality when he's mentioned in two other places. In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 16, we see him actually willing to follow Jesus even if it meant death. Though he's, he comes off as something of a, as a, of a pessimist at that time. And in, uh, in John 14, verse 5, he's mentioned again, exhibiting an ignorance that was not only characteristic of himself, but of all the disciples. But John doesn't paint him in his gospel as some kind of a chronic doubter. If he, we, we have to believe that if he had been present that day with the rest of the disciples when Jesus made his first appearance to them, that he would have likely believed as they did. And so we have to believe that it was all part of God's divine plan and within his sovereign will that uh, Thomas was away and that now he, he questions their claim. When he came together with his brothers, they exclaimed, they burst out in their joy, we have seen the Lord. Thomas is not convinced. He says to them in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas was not about to take their word for it. He wanted to see evidence that whom they had seen was Jesus himself. And the only way in his mind, that that could be proven was to see the actual wounds of Jesus. Now, Jesus had been killed in a very specific way, and so he bore on his body certain marks. 
And Thomas wanted to see those marks to believe that this was actually Jesus. And congregation, this, this helps us actually. This is a, uh, actually a blessing for us and it helps us to believe because the, it, it is the honesty and the rawness of the Holy Scriptures that make them all the more believable. If you read through the Bible and you look at the characters in the Bible, from the Old Testament right into the New Testament, you don't find the Bible um, sugarcoating the, the history of God's salvation of His people. We find people recorded in uh, Bible history, in the, in the history of God's redemption of His people, who were hypocrites, uh, sinners, backsliders, and doubters. And they are, it's all recorded without editing. And it makes the Bible all that more believable. Take the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, for instance. The, the enemies of the church could very easily have been tempted to make a case, and they certainly did, that this was nothing more than a plot by the disciples of Jesus. They could be tempted to say that all that had happened was that Jesus died, and then his disciples went in the night somehow, and they stole the body, and they hid it somewhere, and then they cooked up this whole resurrection story together. But as events were guided by the hand of God, and we have to believe that everything here was under the sovereign will and guiding of God, as events were guided by the hand of God, that accusation that the enemies of the cross would have made has lost any validity. Because here we have recorded one of the very disciples of Jesus who was skeptical about him rising from the dead. Here was evidence that the whole idea of a, of a resurrection arising from the grave was foreign to the minds of these simple men. Thomas wanted physical evidence. This claim you're making, he says to them, in effect, is not something that you see every day. I need more than just your word. I want to see his hands. I want to feel those nail holes. I want to put my hands in his side where that spear was driven. And then I will believe. Now, are we saying that Thomas was a hero for this? Are we saying that he was the only one who had a little common sense, who was practical among the disciples? No, we're not saying that. Uh, Thomas was actually displaying a trait that is common to all people. Jesus even condemned this kind of an attitude in John 4, verse 48. He said, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. And so Jesus even condemns this kind of behavior. Thomas here was guilty of the same charge of Jesus to the uh, two disciples on the road to Emmaus, when he said to them, you are slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. But you see, his unwillingness to believe in the resurrection without physical proof makes it all that more believable. The enemies of, of Christ have attacked the resurrection as being something that was cooked up by a band of, of zealots. They've accused the early church of gradually manufacturing these appearances of Jesus. But here we see the initial report of the resurrection being dismissed by one of the very disciples of Jesus as fantasy and imagination. Those who had not seen Christ with their own eyes refused to accept that he had been raised. We don't see in Thomas a man who gradually came to accept some new plan that they had concocted on their own. He outright rejected the, the resurrection until he could see proof that it had really happened. And yet once again, congregation, we see the amazing patience that our God has in stooping down to us, condescending to us. We find Jesus appearing to Thomas and granting his request. In verse 26, we read that eight days later, the disciples were once again gathered in the same house. And according to the Jewish way of counting, this would have again placed this event on the first day of the week. As a matter of fact, all the significant incidents in the New Testament would now take place on the Lord's Day. And John records, significantly, that the door was again locked. And so the threat of Jewish attack had by no means passed. But again, this poses no, no threat for Jesus, no problem. He comes in and he stands in the midst of them, greeting them as before, Peace be to you. And then he turns his attention to his skeptical disciple. And mindful of our weakness and our slowness to believe, he invites Thomas to get the evidence that he needs and he wants. In verse 27 he says to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hand and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving but believing. Now, 
we can only imagine the state of Thomas's mind at this point. Uh, here was the Lord Jesus, whom he had seen crucified here and dying on the cross and buried in the tomb, standing before him in the flesh. Here was the one who had been dead but was now alive. And not only was Jesus alive, but he was perfectly aware of the unbelief of his disciple. Now, we know that uh, uh, during the time when Jesus walked in the three years with his disciples, um, he, there were many times, many incidents that happened where he would actually know what they were saying, what they were thinking. We would read little accounts of they were walking on the road and the disciples were huddled together in a little group and they were saying things or they were thinking things in their hearts and then Jesus would call them over and he said, Why are you saying that? Why are you thinking that? Now Jesus shows that nothing had changed. Even while he was absent physically, he had heard the words and seen the heart of Thomas. And amazingly, Jesus was willing to submit to Thomas' examination if that would put his mind at ease. That's condescension. That's the, the stooping down in mercy of our God to us. And Jesus said to, to Thomas, Here I am. In the flesh, see me, touch me, believe. Literally, verse 27 reads, Do not be an unbeliever, but a believer. Do not be an unbeliever, but a believer. You see, up to this point, Thomas had been what would we call a, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet and teacher. But Jesus was now calling him to become a Christian. Become a believer in the resurrected Christ. Take upon yourself the yoke of the Lord of salvation, the risen Messiah. Rise to the challenge of becoming a witness to the giver of life who was dead, but now lives. Now the question has been debated long and hard and much has been written about it. Did Thomas actually reach out his hand to touch Jesus? Some are of the opinion that Thomas would not have disobeyed a direct command of Jesus to touch him. Some say that the confession he was about to make could only have come from actually touching the wounds of Jesus. But we have to go by just a straight reading of Scripture. And we don't find here uh, John mentioning that Thomas believed on that basis. Verse 29, in fact, leaves us with the impression that he believed because he had seen. There was no need for him then to actually touch the wounds of Jesus. Here was the Lord commanding him to do what he said he wanted to do. But this was enough for Thomas. No other physical evidence was necessary. His unbelief disappeared with the appearance of his beloved Lord. And he utters one of the most wonderful confessions in the New Testament my Lord and my God. And John takes the time to record this because of his specific focus, his specific goal in his gospel. From the first words of his account, he teaches the divinity of Christ. That's the goal of John in writing the gospel of John and recording what he had seen and heard. Uh, his goal is so that we would know that Jesus Christ was divine. He writes his gospel so that, as we heard in verse 31, we might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in His name. Think about how John begins his Gospel. He announces Jesus as the Word, who was with the Father in the beginning, who was with God and was God. And now as he begins to bring his Gospel to a close, he ends with the con confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God, because that is G John's goal, to point us to the divinity of Jesus. Thomas is not only convinced of the resurrection of Jesus, he is convinced of his deity. And this congregation was a major milestone for Christianity. Up to this moment, no one had ever addressed Jesus that way. But the resurrection changed everything. In that moment, when Thomas saw the risen Lord standing alive among them, when he had his thoughts and words exposed, he understood the implication. Men do not rise from the dead. He was standing in the presence of the living God. And he responded in the only way that mortal creatures must respond in the presence of the living God. He worshipped. In congregation, this is the marvelous way of God. That the church might inherit its most beautiful expression of the deity of Christ from this unyielding, skeptical disciple. Whatever circumstances led him to be absent when Jesus appeared the first time, was all in the providence of God. His absence and then his skepticism was used 
to evoke, to bring forth a confession from him that would echo down through the church age, my Lord and my God. And notice that Thomas claims Christ as my Lord. He belongs to him. He has no other owner, no other shepherd, no other overseer. And he claims him as my God because the pieces have fallen into place in his mind. The scales have fallen from his eyes. Jesus is the God of salvation. Now today we have the Jehovah's Witnesses, the cults who will come knocking on your door and they teach the lie among many other lies that this was just an exclamation of Thomas. They say Thomas was just surprised. The same way people today when they're surprised or they're shocked, they would say, oh my word, or oh my God. That's all Thomas was saying. Well, this is blasphemy. And this expression, first of all, was not in the vocabulary of that time and culture as an exclamation. And certainly no pious Jew would have taken the name of God in vain like that in any way. And so this was nothing less than a confession issuing from the very soul of Thomas as he came to grips with who Jesus really was. He says, my Lord and my God. But listen as well to Jesus' response in verse 29. He says, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, first of all, one of the things we need to see here in, in Jesus' response is that we don't, we don't see here any denial of Jesus that he was entitled to the worship of Thomas. He doesn't stop Thomas and say, stop, don't say that, don't say my Lord and my God to me. He doesn't deny his right to, to, to this kind of an address and this kind of worship. He sees the address as fitting. He is both Lord and God. Thomas had seen and believed, and this was a good thing. Now some scholars think that Jesus, uh, what Jesus says here to Thomas is kind of a rebuke. Uh, if that were true, then the rest of the disciples would be under the same charge. Because we see in verse 20 that he, Jesus had also showed them his hands and side, and they believed. So the first part of Thomas's answer has to be seen merely as a, as a pronouncement. Again, to paraphrase, he, he's saying something like this to Thomas, you have seen me and you have believed good. Good. That's wonderful that you have seen me now and you believe. Because, you see, the Lord had a plan in mind here. And there was something that was going on here. There was a process that was being put into place. The Lord, at this time, and we already see this in verses 21 and following, early as we read, how He breathed on them the Holy Spirit and He tells them about being His witnesses and so on. The Lord was actively preparing His disciples for the church age. They would be His witnesses. They would be His instruments in the spreading of the gospel. The offer of salvation, the good news, would be founded on His resurrection. And so they all had to be fully convinced that Jesus had indeed been raised from the dead after three days. <coughs> Excuse me. But what Jesus adds here is of great significance to us as well. He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This was a major turning point we have to understand for the New Testament church. Jesus was announcing here the beginning of a new era, a change that would come into effect very shortly. He foresees a time when he would not provide the physical evidence that Thomas and the disciples had been given. In a short while, Jesus, we know, would ascend to his Father's right hand. And the world would no longer have physical evidence of his resurrection. And those who would come to believe in Him would not do so by sight, but by faith. They would believe as the Spirit of Christ created faith in their hearts through the preaching of the Gospel of Christ. The world would be called to believe even though they have not seen. A new era was being ushered in, a time of faith, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, to use the language of Hebrews 11 verse 1. And by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, the confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God, would be exclaimed from the mouth of former skeptics, such as you and I. In congregation, our Savior is talking about us here. We who have believed without seeing. Paul wor Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 are ours. We live by faith, not by sight. We say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
Amen to the pronouncement of Peter in 1 Peter 1 verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. In these last days, the risen Christ is being preached to all the world. He is make this, making disciples out of every race, culture and language. And he's drawing his elect, not using visual aids, but by the pure preaching of the gospel. And it began with the preaching of those who were eye eyewitness, eyewitnesses to the glory of Christ. John uh, writes in, uh, first in his, in his uh, letter to the church, the first epistle of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3a, he writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life that is Christ. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, made known to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. The disciples were eyewitnesses to the glory of Christ. And they were then compelled to proclaim what we have not seen and touched. But the blessing spoken by Jesus to Thomas has fallen to us today. Today we gather together to celebrate the foundation of our faith, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice that we serve a risen Savior who has conquered sin and death in our place and that we serve a living Lord. By the power of the Spirit we have believed Without seeing, the Spirit testifies in our hearts that our Savior has risen, that He is alive, and that He is our Lord and God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let us never be, let us never fail to be thrilled by this announcement that Jesus Christ rose from the grave conquering sin and death. Help us never to be bored with it or thinking that there are more important things that we need to concentrate on. Fixing ourselves, fixing our attitude. Uh, Father, may it always begin with what you have established for us in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who enables us to say with Thomas this morning, my Lord and my God, as we reflect upon our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have done all things well. And we pray that just as we have been made audience, that we have heard the glorious gospel and by the power of your Spirit we have believed. We pray that that gospel may continue to go forth into the world in every nation, tongue and culture, and that many would turn from sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and make that great confession with us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 356 is our hymn of response, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas of number 356.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may now continue to worship you by the giving of our offering, uh, answering the, so- the call of the psalmist where he says, uh, where he tells us to come into your house and bring an offering. And uh, we pray that uh, we thank you that we may give toward the fund for needy churches uh, in our classes. We uh, thank you for, for each congregation and we pray that you would, through us and through the churches, uh, uh, provide for them that they may be able to meet their financial obligations. Bless us as we give to their needs and as we give uh, ultimately to the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, lift up your hearts to heaven and receive the Lord's blessing as we part. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Number 361, stanza 4 only, is our doxology. Mm-hmm. 